I'm going to introduce Laura today. All of you have seen, heard a little bit from about Laura earlier today, being our secretary, past president of ReCamps, been on the board on the statewide camp, which I, I want to say one of the things not everyone may realize that a few years back, the board uh, at the time had, I think, a very misguided uh, idea of changing the mission of camp statewide. And Laura was one of the people that really spearheaded trying to stop that movement and successfully. So I, I, I thank you for that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in her work as a therapist, Laura is both an MFT and a certified rehab counselor specializing in trauma recovery, brain injury, hearing issues, autoimmune disorder, and other hidden disabilities. And uh, for the past five years, or I'm sorry, four or five years, Laura worked at Stanford doing clinical research trials, testing short-term treatments that help people heal from significant traumas. Um, Laura now offers the Stanford Q-Centered Treatment for Trauma in her private practice. And today she's going to be talking about uncovering hidden brain injury and talking about research findings on how to help. Thank you, Laura. Well, thank you, everybody. It's really great to be here with all of you. And, uh, and I really second, you know, what Charles and what Gail uh, expressed, you know, how wonderful it is to actually be in a room, in a community of healers. We're so fortunate to have each other now more than ever. So I am here to talk to you along with um, the spirit of... Hercule Poirot, or however you pronounce his name, came along to talk about how MFTs can be sleuths. So we're all going to put on our pretend Sherlock Holmes hats and uh, have bubble pipes or something and uh, talk about brain injury. So by thoroughly assessing our patients, which we do, uh, we know exactly what sorts of events have happened to them and a sense of the, the, trouble, the troubles that they're having interacting with the world. And I was going to say, I don't know, Bob had to leave a little bit early, but anyway, Bob Casanova is the reason that I have patient clients up there because he's pointed out to me there's no HIPAA compliance that affects clients. They're all patients. And so those are the terms that um, we need to use when we're communicating with doctors or other professionals. Okay. Now, do I need to be pointing? This is not working. Oh, it is? Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So now we're going to talk about the case of Ms. B, a suggestion gone awry. Disclaimer that these case studies are combined, you know, multiple people uh, in the case study, so no particular person. Okay. All right, so Miss B went to marriage counseling. She saw an MFT and, uh, with her partner, and this MFT said, you seem like a person with ADHD. So she went to her medical provider and says, my marriage counselor says I have ADHD. So the RN that saw her prescribed Adderall, and then because she couldn't sleep, she got guanfacine, and then she got Ativan because she couldn't calm down. So she'd take the Ativan around 2 p.m. every day. Wait a minute. Yep. The thing is, it's not advancing my own personal computer here. Uh, so, all right. Life events checklist revealed that um, there was a biking accident at age 10 in which she flipped over the handles of the bar and landed on a, with her forehead, landed on a rock. Had a loss of consciousness for 15, about 15 minutes. Um, but a jobs history showed that she had had 24 jobs in a 20 year period. Yeah, and they rarely lasted more than 90 days. So there was this cycle of she's looking for a job, she gets a job, now she's in the job, now she's about to lose the job. And uh, you can imagine what this did for the couple's income and their stability. So this was a, this was a problem. So we referred her for neuropsych testing and 
found out she could transfer a zip code from one computer to the next screen only one digit at a time. That is how damaged her short-term memory was, drastically damaged. So having a proper diagnosis led to um, solving the addiction problem with the Ativan, and she slowly titrated off. She um, used the taper method by uh, Dr. Heather Ashton. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but you, know, you can search on YouTube for Heather Ashton taper. And it takes about a year, I think, generally, to get off benzos. And it's a you know, matter of c cutting it down by a tiny, tiny amount and staying two weeks on that amount and then another little tiny amount. So anyway, it takes a while. Um, she was very depressed that she was a failure at life. So it really helped with that. And because she had been depressed, she had been chronically suicidal. So it solved that problem. And um, since her partner now realized that she couldn't work, they made adjustments to, to deal with that. And so that strengthened the partnership. Um, and then she was able to apply for SSDI. All right, now we have the case of Mr. T. Is he a malingerer? All right. So he didn't attend school between sixth grade and, and the end of high school. And uh, he, I asked why, he said he was just too anxious, didn't, you know, just couldn't handle going to school. Um, had gotten a college degree and had worked two years as kind of in a clerical position, but was so suicidal the whole time. And wound up moving in with a partner and just not working. And, uh, and that had worked for a lot of years until uh, the partner had sort of suggested that perhaps he should be getting a job, you know, because it had been a long time. And so this wound up with the two of them separating for some time. And so he moved home with his folks and had gotten a driver's license and now in coming to my office, had to sleep, had to get there an hour early to be able to sleep in the car for 45 minutes. And then after leaving me, had to sleep in the car for another 45 minutes or an hour before having the energy to drive 15 minutes home. Yeah. So, I said, well, okay, let me say a couple more things about him. He, he was accused of being a malingerer by family and friends. And he could not understand why he couldn't do things. And he was very well-spoken, had a college degree, right? He was very depressed and very anxious and worried about how he's going to take care of himself when he aged. So I said, you know what explains all these things? A brain injury. I think you have a brain injury. And uh, he said, no, there's no history of uh, brain injury in my family that I know of. I've never been dropped. And I said, did you have a high fever? Nope, never had a high fever. Nothing that he knew about at all. So he didn't return for six months because coming to the office had been so stressful. But he did return and then I again, you know, it just has the same list again, and I again say, you know what explains all of this? You, it's a brain injury. I, I, I know you have a brain injury. He says, no, I don't have a brain injury. I said, yes, you do. You just don't know what happened. So he goes home and asks his mother, who says, oh, there was that time you got encephalitis in the sixth grade. Yeah. So I think comes again, and I say, well, sounds like you've got post-encephalitic syndrome. And he just definitely could not accept that. Um, and furthermore, I was getting really terrible messages that, you know, only malingerers collect Social Security, and, you know, uh, you wouldn't want to be that kind of person. Um, so he thinks he is malingering. <laughs> he really thinks he is malingering. 
Anyway, so we sent them out for some testing, um, and turned out his cognitive stamina so limited that from one minute in the test to the second minute, in the second minute, the accuracy dropped 60% on every kind of cognitive exam that he was given. So can you imagine that being, you know, that you're suddenly 60% wrong literally one minute later from, what, from the information that you're trying to take in? All right. All right, so the testing also showed that he needed a break of five minutes for every 10 minutes of the test. And, um, and a big part of his right visual field is present, but not recording. Uh, it's uh, hemiano hemianopsia is the term for it. So, so for example, in driving the car, which was way too stressful, um, uh, you know, he could be, he wouldn't see, let's say, a pedestrian, you know, on the sidewalk right next to him, and so I felt like it was really too dangerous for him to drive, and advised that he not do so. <clears throat> so the result, of course, florid postencephalitic syndrome was the diagnosis. So I wrote to the medical provider, provided the cognitive testing and the results and the symptom list, and then helped him to try to understand that he never was malingering and to encourage him to do self-advocacy, which is really hard. So <clears throat> I coached him into filing for SSI. That was a hard one. <laughs> he got it right away. You know, and uh, with that, if you file for any kind of Social Security benefit under disabilities, 66% are turned down the very first time, and uh, only 33% are approved. Well, you know, and then the 66%, so you turn it down, you appeal it, they reconsider if they made a mistake, and then they decide, no, they didn't, and they turn you down again, so you appeal it again, and then now they say, well, it's going to have to go to the judge, and the judge is like 18 months out. So, and then the judge can turn you down and you can appeal it again and it can go on beyond that and you can appeal it yet again. Um, but anyway, it's a very long process. So getting it right away is a big marker of how bad they felt that it was too. So it's the first time he's ever had income. He's been living off the charity of others for like a decade. So he's certain he's going to lose it when he gets reassessed in two years because, you know, he looks like a nice person, can carry on a conversation, cannot remember the conversation, you know, afterwards, but um, he thinks, you know, hmm, he's going to lose it because nobody's, everybody's going to still think that he's malingering. So uh, Part of it was helping him cope with the guilt about that he's never going to be able to work because the, the, you know, the accommodation of working for 10 minutes and then taking a five-minute rest, which he required laying down flat, you know, there's no employer that's going to, that's not a reasonable accommodation. Nobody's going to accommodate that. <clears throat> okay, so this brings us up to our uh, discussion question, which is, have you or someone you love experienced a brain injury? And if so, what was the most challenging part of the recovery? And I thought if you, we could just uh, speak in dyads and I'll time it and give you guys like three minutes, one person share, and then three minutes, maybe the other, two or three minutes, the other person share. So anyway, I'll, I'll let you know when the time's up, okay? Okay, everybody come on back. All right. Oops. So now I'd like to talk a little bit about, I'm just, I put this slide in here. Come on. 
I put this slide in here of basic brain anatomy just as a reminder of, you know, kind of the gross overarching parts of the brain that can be injured with any particular kind of brain injury. So I just put this in as a reminder. And um, generally, the accepted definition of, MT, of a mild TBI, um, or M, they call it MTBI, uh, has been decided upon by the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine. And so it means that you, there's maybe been some loss of consciousness that might or might not happen, uh, loss of memory, um, an alteration in your uh, mental state, so maybe you feel like, you know, having your bell rung, that feeling. Um, and it, you might or might not have neurological deficits that are transient. So the loss of consciousness has to be less than 30 minutes. Now, if you ask me, one of my kids was lost in, you know, had a loss of consciousness for more than, I don't know, three minutes, I would be freaking out. <laughs> I would not consider that a mild TBI. I, I mean, I just, less than 30 minutes, you know? All, yeah, anyway. And, uh, but the score on the Glasgow Coma Scale, which is a widely accepted scale for measuring brain, brain injury, has to be in the upper limits, and 15 is the top of the scale. And um, post-traumatic amnesia shouldn't exceed 24 hours. So that's the definition of a mild one. So here's a few little tidbits of interest. Neurotransmitters running our engine. Dopamine is, of course, the pleasure when we accomplish a goal. And it's uh, our natural caffeine, nicotine, or cocaine. Uh, and norepinephrine is, it, it's called norepinephrine in our country just to confuse everyone else, you know, that exists because it's adrenaline in every other country. <laughs> So, you know, I, I know that I was kind of confused about adrenaline for years and norepinephrine for years, but anyway, it's just because we like to be different. So, uh, Rick Olchese gave this, um, this, this thought about how comparing nor neurotransmitters to a car. So, dopamine and norepinephrine are the gas running the engine. Serotonin is cruise control. Melatonin is a cousin to serotonin and part of the cruise control. And uh, GABA is the inhibitory neurotransmitter, so it's our brake, our braking system. And acetylcholine is the accelerator. Anyway, I just I like that and threw that in for you guys. All right, so let's run over some brain injury nomenclature. So you can either have a closed or an open brain injury. And uh, alteration of consciousness is abbreviated AOC, um, the feeling of bringing, having your bell rung. Loss of consciousness, abbreviated LOC. You got post-injury amnesia in the Glasgow Coma Scale. All right, there's, in, in the kinds of brain injuries, there's diffuse axonal injury or shaken baby syndrome. Uh, you may recall that the gray matter in our brains is the cell body, or the, the soma, the nucleus of the cell, and the white matter um, is that long axon, and then it's covered with myelin sheath, which is a fatty substance, which is white. So that's the white matter of our uh, brains. And why do we need myelin? Because it's the difference between sliding down a wooden pole and sliding down a wooden pole with Crisco all over it, with grease all over it. So the electrical impulses go a lot faster um, with myelin. Diffuse axonal injury happens when there's a twisting injury, um, which can shear off some of the axons, like whiplash, you know, or shaken baby. A concussion is like a mild sprain to the brain, now, if you sprained your ankle the next day, or the same day, you would, you would wrap up your foot with an ACE bandage, and you would elevate it, and you would put ice packs on it, and maybe alternate heat and cold, and you wouldn't go to work. Uh, you certainly wouldn't, if you were a runner, you wouldn't run a marathon the next day on a sprained ankle. 
Um, we, we wouldn't think that you could run 26 miles the next day on your sprained ankle. And so, why, you know, why, why do we think that a person with a concussion should immediately go back to work at full capacity when they've sprained their brain? <clears throat> so, in fact, doing that makes the ankle and the brain a lot worse. Um, a contusion is a bruise that can be seen on the brain. Sometimes those have to be removed surgically. Coup, contra coup injury uh, is when you get hit in one side and then it causes your brain to slam into this side, right? And then, and then you come back, you know, as you're coming back, it then slams back into where you originally hit. So my daughter got one of these uh, injuries when she was babysitting, or I think she was working at a daycare, and a kid who was like a wannabe Pele, uh, it was maybe eight feet away from her and kicked a soccer ball into her head. And um, so she, went, you know, she, she wound up with this coup, contra coup injury. And three months later, I mean, we had her at the neurologist because she was still having all these symptoms from it. But I remember that about three days after it had happened, she and her younger brother were in Safeway. And Suddenly, she didn't. He, he went off to go get something. They were shopping at a list, and and suddenly he was gone. And she didn't know how to get out of the store, where he was, why she was there, and um, and she just sat down, <laughs> and you know was got tearful and and was calling out for him. And then he came back and found her on the floor, you know, in tears and. So anyway, uh, I had, uh, it's scary. <laughs> These kinds of inju injuries are pretty scary. All right, anoxic uh, brain injury is no oxygen. Hypoxia is, um, there might be some oxygen. Uh, so depending, you know, either anoxia or hypoxia could include drowning. You can get a penetrating injury, which of course is rare. Uh, but not for veterans. And then second impact syndrome is when you've had an injury and you still haven't healed from it, and then you have another one. Yeah, all bad. All right. The Glasgow Coma Scale is a 15-point scale that's looking at uh, your motor response, your verbal response, and your eyes. So Basically, if you get the top score in each of those categories, you'll get a 15 and, um, you know, you're fine. All of us are 15 <laughs> here. But um, if you're getting something less, then that's not good, <laughs> right? Um, the score of, uh, a score of 13 to 15 is considered a mild brain injury, and the l loss of consciousness has to be less than 30 minutes. A score of 9 to 12 is, means that you're going to have moderate disability from it, and usually the loss of consciousness is over 30 minutes. Score of 3 to 8 is severe disability, and 0 to 3 is the person is basically brain dead. Uh, CDC statistics on brain injury are that it's a big portion of all accidental deaths and um, also ER visits. And they, it disproportionately affects two categories, which are 0 to 14 and over 75. Um, when I worked, as a, I worked as an elder care manager for Masonic Homes, and one of the things that I would tell my clients is, Falls are the number one reason why people can't age in place in their home. And so you should get anything that creates a fall risk out of your house. You know, if there's rugs, cords, uh, anything, you know, furniture that's badly placed, junk on the floors, anything that puts you at risk of a fall uh, is bad news and you gotta clean it up. <laughs> All right, so, of course, uh, after receiving a brain injury, you, you, the treatment is trying to reduce the swelling or maybe if there's pressure that's built up, um, making sure there's adequate blood flow to the injured tissue, 
this was interesting and I, that I learned that it can cause this increase in adenosine and glutamate in the tissues that's surrounding the injury. And so that can become inflammatory. So a lot of times they will administer uh, an IV with some drugs to inhibit the release of glutamate. So that's a good reason to go to the emergency room if you've had a fall, actually, just to get that. Um, so, and if it's an acute TBI, you know, you know it because there's all these different kinds of things that the doctors wind up doing for you. Now, um, I want to mention if hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus, I don't know, I'm from Texas, so. <laughs> Anyway, if water on the brain develops, sometimes you could get a diagnosis of normal pressure hydrocephalus, NPH. There is nothing normal about that, okay? And as it gets worse, it causes people's legs to feel like they're in concrete and that they can't move them, and they wind up actually in a wheelchair from it. Uh, they lose bowel and bladder incontinence. They have hallucinations, and the hallucinations there, they see people who talk to them who look as real as we look to each other. And um, they only wind up in a wheelchair. So the treatment is, uh, let's see, I put that here. Oh, no, I didn't. The treatment is a shunt. So they put a little tube in going into um, one of the um, openings in there, let's see, into the ventricle, and then, it, so it comes out the side of the head, and usually, it, usually it's on this side, and then the tube runs down through your skin, under your skin, down your neck, and into your body cavity, so it's draining cerebral spinal fluid into your body cavity. Um, and sometimes they do this with Alzheimer's, and the test to find out whether a shunt would help is after they rule out all kinds of other things that could be causing the problem, uh, they basically bring the person in and remove a large syringe of cerebral spinal fluid and then see if their mobility improves, you know, see if their, their cognition improves. And if they have a sudden improvement, then um, you know, over the next, like, it's, you know, it's pretty rapid, actually. It's like within a few hours. Then they know that they're a good candidate for a shunt. Um, my sister-in-law's mom actually just had a shunt put in for Alzheimer's. So that was the, I hadn't known that this was done for Alzheimer's. But anyway, she had a big improvement when they did the test. And then they put the shunt in, and she's been nauseous and weak ever since. <laughs> so uh, it's been like this huge bummer because she was so good when they initially removed the fluid. All right, so I went to a brain injury conference and actually was real interested in, uh, I went to several of the military presentations. Um, and so uh, one of the, you know, they think of all the things that we would think about causing a brain injury, but they're also concerned about a blast injuries and they can create three different kinds of brain injury. So you might get an object that hits you in the head, you might be hurled, you know, and then you strike your head upon landing, and the third thing is the blast wave itself, and that is not to be underestimated. Um, so, so they take it very seriously, and they've got a protocol where if they're considered by their standards level two TBI, they put the person immediately to bed for seven days. And um, I, I mean, I, I think actually our, the general public would do well to find out that it's important to actually rest your brain immediately after a brain injury. And if you don't, you are prolonging the amount of time it's going to take for you to get well by a lot. So you should do it. So, level three, they evacuate the soldier. And um, the big thing I think people don't, maybe don't realize is that brain injuries cause major, major fatigue. And that fatigue can last 
I mean, it can be just, it can last forever. I mean, it can be just a result of the brain injury that the person's going to have to deal with lifelong fatigue. There are ways to sort of minimize the fatigue in how they structure their day. So residual problems, I think, you know, we all got taught this in grad school. It's diagnosed usually as post-concussional syndrome, and it can include chronic pain and dizziness and fatigue and, you know, personality changes. So the risks, of course, are getting post-concussional syndrome. If you had too many of them, or it's too bad, you might get chronic traumatic encephalopathy, which is what all the football players are coming down with. Not good. And, um, and in fact, at that brain conference, uh, I went to a hearing, one of the presentations was on that, and um, they were showing this very tiny movement that occurs in an 18-year-old young man who had had several concussions from football, high school football, and he already at 18 had CTE. So, uh, I don't know, we gotta rethink football, I think. Of course, you can wind up with major or minor neurocognitive disorder. All right, so some of the physical um, symptoms post-concussion. Here are some of the post-concussion symptoms. Lots of, you know, can be balance problems, um, blurry vision, being so sensitive to light or sound. A uh, person that comes to see me who has a bad brain injury is always wearing sunglasses and she's always wearing uh, earplugs. The, always. And I do my um, sessions with anyone with a brain injury. I do the session in the dark. I turn off all the lights and I usually invite them to lay on the couch if they would like, if, you know, if they'd feel comfortable doing that. Um, and to close their eyes so that while they're in there, they're not having to use all of their senses, you know, with all the incoming data stream, you know, of being in my busy office and all the sample figures on the shelves that, you know, are hard to look at. Well, yeah. Would you include sense sensitivity in there as well? You bet. In fact, sense, sense sensitivity is such a big issue that we actually have it on our door, our front door says, you know, please don't wear scents in our office. All right, um, some of the cognitive issues, you know, your processing speed can be slowed down, your ability to pay attention for long periods of time, oops, um, executive functioning problems, there are a myriad that can happen. And then, of course, uh, brain injury causes organic anxiety and depression. And part of how that happens is uh, one of the reactions to being hit in the head is that um, there's this neurochemical cascade resulting in inflammation. And one of the problems is a flood of cytokine cells, C-Y-T-O-K-I-N-E. And I didn't put this in here, uh, a referral, a reference for you, but I should have. Um, so anyway, people wind up with this big flood of cytokine cells in their brain, and that uh, leads to organic depression and, and anxiety. And I think in a way that anxiety is caused by your brain going, please, 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 don't shake me again, don't shake me again, don't do that, don't go there. I could get shook, stay home, because it is really dangerous out there. And so, you know, that your brain really, really doesn't want you to shake it again after a brain injury. Um, all right. So you could wind up with all kinds of things that happen, like a, a change in your vision, um, being able to carry out things, you know, sensory losses or weakness on one side or all kinds of problems. All right. 
If you terminate, do you guys know this? If you terminate an SSRI six months after the depression lifts, you have a 50-50 chance of it re recurring. But if you wait a full year after the depression lifts, there's only a 10% chance of recurrence. So that's a really good thing for us to be teaching our clients. Oh, here's a few more tidbits. Uh, stimulants are taking the place of dopamine. Um, if you're, how many people are sleeping less than seven hours a night regularly? Would you? Okay. Now, now that I'm retired. No, no right, okay. Yeah, because you're all going to get Alzheimer's. <laughs> so, uh, and I was doing it too. But uh, that, I made that a New Year's resolution last year to stop that because you increase your risk about like 30%. It's huge. Don't do it. Um, you, you, you like commit yourself to always sleeping set between seven and eight hours a night, always. And if you have a brain injury, nine would be good. All right, so uh, taking benzodiazepines, of course, substantially raises the risk, as you know, of Alzheimer's. Oh, concussion injury can look like fast cycling bipolar disorder. So that's good to keep in mind as you're, you know, thinking up, you know, kind of trying to assess what's going on with your clients. Oops, okay. All right, so we have another discussion question. This was actually uh, a, like a, two years ago, I think, you guys voted that you would be totally into doing two hour, these, having these be two hours and having discussion questions that were part of the uh, the thing, so I, uh, um, you know, thought, well, maybe we'll get there. <laughs> so anyway, um, so I thought up discussion questions, if we would have had, you know, like ta tables for discussion, but I think they're valuable anyway. So let's again, in your dyads, uh, talk about what struggles that you have observed with clients who have brain injuries, and were you able to help them or not help? <laughs> in which case, you know, were you really frustrated by that? So, yeah. I wonder how many people have had clients with brain injuries. Lots and lots of people. You've had people with brain injury on your caseload and you didn't know it. Right. Yeah. So the question is, how do you distinguish, how do you make that diagnosis from other things that may look very much the same? Yeah, that's a good question. We're going to get to that. Okay. So if you guys would talk for a couple minutes and then I'll let you know and then you'll switch about this question. Okay. 